Can we, can we just stay standing for a moment to honor the Lord? You're like, we just stood for a long, long time. Let us sit. Jesus is here. Everything I need is here. Because Jesus is here. So everything I need is here. Can you lift up your hands and just say that in this room, just with me? Say, Jesus is here. Everything I need is here. I'm singing a revelation for all of us if we get it. Say, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Everything I need is here. I want you to remember this when you go home, wherever you are. Would you sing it again? Say, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. So everything, everything I need is here. No matter what you need tonight, when Jesus is here, everything we need is here. One more time. Come on, say, Jesus is here. Yes, Lord. Everything I need is If you came in needing healing or breakthrough or deliverance, it's all found when Jesus is in the room. Come on, say it. Say, Jesus is Oh, everything. Everything I need is so, Father, I pray that tonight you would meet the needs of every person in this room. I thank you for the word of the Lord, which you've deposited in my heart to be strength and encouragement to every pastor and leader in this room, everyone who is watching live now and everyone who will watch a replay. Father, I pray that you move by the power of your spirit in this moment. We depend completely and totally on you. We recognize our own need for you, our own frailty. We pray that by the power of your spirit, you would interpret every word to the hearer so that they would hear exactly what it is that you want them to hear, what it is that you want them to receive. And may all of us be changed because of the declaration and proclamation of your word tonight. I pray as always that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redemption. Redeemer, be glorified in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I would say be seated, but just like Pastor Patrick, I have a, a tradition at our home as well when we read the word of the Lord that we stand. The reason why we do that is not just because we have some quirky traditionalism or anything of that nature. In fact, I didn't do it for a while, but we kind of recovered it in our church because we wanted to say to the Lord that your word is above everything else. We don't stand to read anything else. It's not equal to anything else. And so it's our way of honoring him. And so I want to read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6 in a New King James Version. And it reads this way. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless in the air of my house as Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. You can be seated. You can be seated. I want to say that I count it a 
high privilege and honor um, to be here to speak um, and have the opportunity to share for the third year in a row uh, at MFI. And I am, I'm, I don't take that lightly. I really don't. I recognize that any of you could be speaking. Uh, they could ask anyone from around the world to be speaking. And so I recognize that it is an honor. I want to thank uh, Dr. Frank, who's not here, uh, the MFI leadership, uh, everyone uh, who is involved with MFI. Thank you so much. When I came this time, uh, Pastor John John gave me a hug and said, welcome home. Uh, and I loved that. Uh, it made me feel really good. And uh, so glad to see so many familiar faces as well. Um, for the sake of my time, I'm going to jump right into it, but I do at least need to tell you one quick testimony. I have to tell it really, really fast, though. When I was with you two years ago, I just told you that um, we had walked away uh, from a building, uh, and, and I was my faith was stirred, and many of you said you'd be praying for us, and at the time, that if I, if I had the time to tell you the story of the roller coaster uh, that happened with that particular property, uh, but the good news is that just this past Sunday, we dedicated that property to the Lord. We are in it, and the Lord came through. Amen. That was a significant thing the Lord did for our, for our people, uh, but the testimony is not just what he did for us, but what he did in us. He taught us what prevailing prayer is, uh, and so I'm so, so grateful for that. Um, so my time here is shorter than my time at home, so I'm going to run to it, all right? <laughs> um, Y'all understand that predominantly black churches preach longer than this, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, Somebody said, take your time. The only people that can say that are the ones who have the authority to change the clock. <laughs> so <laughs> she has the authority. Okay, all right. <laughs> my, my assignment tonight um, is a word of strength and encouragement. Um, the Lord actually uh, laid this on my heart. Um, typically, as I'm praying, and I was praying for this, uh, the Lord laid this on my heart to strengthen and encourage uh, all of us in this room. Um, I've had the opportunity to not be here for the entire time, but what I was doing was listening and watching on YouTube, and, and we've heard some really, really great things over the course of these three days. Um, while I wasn't in the room, I was watching online, and there have been some really great things and strong things released in this, in this conference, in this time together. And uh, before I came, the Lord deposited something into my heart to release, and being here has done nothing but confirm that uh, and strengthen that conviction for me. Thank you so much, Clay. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit later. Um, but um, I, I know that this is a, a pastors and leaders conference, and so most of what I'm going to say you already know, but I want you to have your heart open uh, to receive. Um, faith is a journey. Faith is a journey. The journey of faith is a journey to a revelation, not necessarily a destination. Um, that's important for us to recognize uh, because we tend to be enamored with the destination. Uh, most of us as, as pastors and leaders, um, a lot of times even when we tell our testimony, even the testimony that I just told you, I told you the end, but I didn't tell you the journey. Because a lot of times we tend to be more enamored with the destination uh, than we do the journey. But God is interested in the journey. That's what God is interested in. We love to testify about getting to the destination, but we don't always talk about the journey. The journey of faith is a journey to a revelation and not necessarily a destination. And there are moments in our journey with God when everything seems to be going according to plan. And we love it based on what we've heard from God. Uh, and then sometimes uh, he throws us a curveball. <laughs> because he's interested in the journey. And the curveball, at times, if we were to be very honest tonight, can shake our confidence and cause us to question everything, including what we've heard from him. Now, I will say that tonight, in order to receive what the Lord has given me, you're going to have to be honest, but thankfully, we're in a safe space to be honest because most of us would not be as honest and open if we were around all of our people the way we can be honest because we're around other leaders. We, we are in a room where we can be honest with God and honest with each other. As pastors, we don't get the luxury of making decisions that affect only us. 
We, we, we don't get that luxury. Sometimes uh, in, this, in this past year and a half or so, um, we, we wish we could just make a decision that affects us alone. But, but truthfully, um, it doesn't just affect us. It doesn't just affect our families. It affects hundreds and sometimes thousands of lives are impacted by the decision that we make. And everyone expects us to lead with a steady hand and confidence when the changing dynamics around us make everything seem unsure. Many of you in this room are great leaders. I just want to sow that into you. Many of you are really, really great leaders, and most would never know by looking at you in this last season that the last season has shaken your confidence and been filled with a lot of internal questioning, and yet you've remained faithful to the call. You, you almost feel guilty for the internal questions that you've wrestled with, but I want you to know that you are not alone. The internal questions that you've been wrestling with, I told you my word is for strength and encouragement, not necessarily revelation, although there is some in here, but it's strength and encouragement for us because for many of us, we need to know that it's okay uh, to not know sometimes. Uh, many of us as, as pastors and leaders, particularly those of us who have a prophetic sense or, uh, or a prophetic gift, um, we, we feel like saying, I don't know, is antithetical to everything that we're supposed to be. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes we just don't know. And it's okay. <laughs> we're not alone, not just now, but not alone historically and not alone biblically. Um, to jump right into it, I, I read to us Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 15 uh, is a part of an overarching story. As you know, Abram is on a journey of faith, walking into what he believes is his promise when a curveball is thrown at him and his confidence is shaken. The passage that I, I opened up with begins with three words, after these things. After these things, some translations say some time later. In order to understand the power of these three words after these things, we have to enter into the journey of faith. I want to remind us of the journey of faith. A lot of us have preached this stuff before, uh, but I want to remind us of it again. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading this in a New Living Translation. It says, The Lord has said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I, that I will show you. I will make you into a a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Iran, and he headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived at Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, we all know this. Go to the land that I will show you. Now, what God had in mind was more than what Abram knew, but he still went. At this point, Abram went without even talking or asking any questions. Now, for us, I didn't start with a funny anecdotal story or things like that because I was worried about my time. And you had some people who are great storytellers who are already here, so I just had to jump right into it. <laughs> like Abram, we receive a word not fully understanding it, but in obedience and perhaps in excitement over what was said, we begin. That's how most visionaries begin. God gives us a dream. God gives us a word. God gives us a vision. We have an encounter with God. He tells us something. He shows us something, and we go for it. We're not worried about the journey. We're not thinking about all the winds and turns and ups and downs and valleys and all that kind of stuff. We're like, God showed me this. We're telling everybody what God has told us. We're telling everybody 
what God has shown us and we are excited about it. Now, can you imagine if God had given you a word like he gave Abram? You would probably be really excited about it and you would go. God said he's going to show me a land that is mine. He's going to make me a great nation. He's going to bless me. He's going to make me famous. He, he's, he, and he said that anyone who blesses me, they will be blessed. And if anyone dishonors me, he will curse. Could you imagine? Come on, let's go. Come with me. We're going somewhere. God's about to bless me. When I blow up, you're going to blow up. We are going to be amazing. <laughs> and God leads him here. Here's your land. Your descendants will have this land. I know that there are people in it right now, but, but I'm going to give it to your descendants. It's, it's like many of you who, who walk around your city and you see a piece of property or a building or, and a business is already there, but you're like, God said that's ours. It, it's ours. And, and so we're, we're taking it. We're, we're taking the land. This is, this is God's promise. And everything uh, seems to be going according to plan. He's like, I can see it. This is akin to what we would call our vision. I, I can see it. I, I know what the future looks like. And we tell people what we think the future looks like. And everything begins in Abram's life and in ours according to plan. You see, when, when the Lord was dealing with me about, about planning a church, um, I wasn't as eager as Abram. Abram didn't say anything. He just went. If, if you knew the story uh, of, of how the Lord arrested me in order to plant a church, it, it, it's crazy. So, so I, I'll tell you the quick story since I didn't start with a story. <laughs> Literally, I, went, I, was, I was on staff as a pastor at a church. And I was on staff as a worship pastor at a church, and I'm like, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm happy leading worship. God's using me around the world in worship. I'm really, really honored that he's doing that and everything else. So I'm totally good, happy at the church, everything else. And so the church said, hey, we want to plant other churches and do satellites and stuff like that. And so there was a major church planning conference that was in our city. And so they said, hey, we're, we're going to send all the pastors to the church planning conference in order for you guys to learn, you know, everything you need to learn to become a multi-site and all this stuff and so I'm like okay cool let's go so I'm at the, this, the church planning conference and somewhere in the middle of the church planning conference the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says you're not here for them and I'm like uh didn't hear that <laughs> so literally literally I stopped attending as if I could cut the voice of God off <laughs> I went home and I didn't attend. They paid for me and everything, but I didn't show up for the rest of it. I'm like, mm -mm, nope, didn't hear that. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> and so, but, but the, the crazy thing is, um, uh, my lifelong brother, best friend, I'm an only child, but, but I'm not an only child because I have a brother who I've known for over 30 years. Um, he, every time when we were kids, um, every time a prophet would come, they would always give him a word about planning a church and all this apostolic work he was going to do and everything else. And then they would always talk to me about worship. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll help him. We're brothers. We're going to go together. He's going to plant the church and then I'm going to lead worship and I'll be his number two. And I was cool with that. So I called him and I said, uh, man, there's this really great church planning conference you should probably go to. <laughs> I said, listen, I believe in your future so much, I'll pay for it. And then I said, I'll even go with you since we're talking about doing something together in the future. So the next year, it came around, I went back to the church planning conference. And so we're in one of the breakout sessions where they're talking about the characteristics of a lead pastor and they're describing all these gift mixes and stuff like that. And the whole time it's like, well, hey, like that kind of sounds like me and him. So how is this going to work? And so literally the Holy Spirit said to me, why are you ignoring me? And I said, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. And then the Holy Spirit said to me a second time, why are you ignoring me? Do you know what I said? I'm not. <laughs> and, then, and then my friend who I paid for the conference and was sitting next to him, in the middle while somebody was up talking, taps me on the leg and says, hey, I know this is going to sound really weird, but the Holy Spirit just told me to ask you why you're ignoring him. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
Do you want to know what I said? I'm not. <laughs> I was hard-headed. I was hard-headed. Part, 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 part of the, 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 the curveball for me was I was one month away from getting married. And my, my fiance, my wife, who is currently my wife, spoiler, um, um, uh, and will always be my wife. Let me just something to say currently. <laughs> hey, man, she's watching. I love you. Um, what she had told me prior to that time was, I don't want to marry a lead pastor. And so now one month before my wedding, the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm calling you to be a lead pastor. So I'm like, so does this mean the wedding's off? Does this mean whatever? And so ultimately, long story short, I told my wife, she said, God already told me. I just hadn't told you because you had never said anything. And so we are married. We're leading the church together. Here, here's the amazing thing, too. Here's the amazing thing. My friend who I uh, went to the conference with, paid for his conference, he's the executive pastor of our church. A role reversal a little bit. I thought I was going to help him. He's helping me, and we're, we're doing this thing together. This is, this is sometimes things go according to plan. And so this is exactly how Abram's life began. His life went according to plan. I, I didn't have that kind of, I just go. Abram just kind of went. So, so in Genesis chapter 12, what we have is that, that God speaks to Abram and he says, leave and go to a place I'll show you. And so here he is, he's off. He doesn't even speak to God. The, the scripture doesn't even say he talks to God. He, he tells everybody else and they, they're off on this journey of faith. By chapter 13, he is in this journey of faith, but he deals with the unexpected separation between him and Lot. But he remains confident that God is with him because he has a promise. He's so confident in the promise that he has from God that when he has to separate from Lot, he says, listen, man, you take whatever part that you see fit to take. He's not just, he's not trying to hold on to something for himself. He's like, listen, if you, if you go right, I'll go left. If you go left, I'll go right. You examine the land, whatever you want to do, you take that land. Why does he do that? Because he knows that he has something that Lot does not have directly. He has a promise from God. The promise from God is so sure that ultimately when he takes a, the, a different part of the land and God says, listen, lift, look, everywhere you look is yours. That, that's the, the, the surety of the promise. That's Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 through 18. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction, north, south, east, and west. I am giving all of this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I'll give you so many descendants like the dust of the earth that cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction for I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his camp to Hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to Memory. And then there, he built another altar to the Lord. Now, by the time we get to chapter 14, what happens is that a war breaks out among several kings and Lot, who he loves, is captured. But afterwards, Abram makes a decision to go after Lot. He goes after Lot. And what happens there is um, he, he gets Lot back. And when he gets Lot back, he makes a, a pivotal decision not to keep any of the goods or the land. And that's where we get to chapter 15, where I started before. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. By chapter 15, what is happening is a curveball has happened and he is now wrestling with the decision and possibly disappointment when God gives him the word of the Lord. Now, based on the word that God speaks to him and based on Abram's response, we can surmise exactly what's going on in Abram's heart, fear and disappointment. The sentiment of the passage here is that Abram was disappointed and questioning. I know that as we read through the narrative, when we get to that part, it doesn't necessarily scream that to us unless you look at it overall in the context, which is why after these things is also translated as some time later. There was this gap of time that this curveball took place and Abram is now plagued with questions. Did I do the right thing? Did I make the right choice? Did I miss God? Did I hear correctly? 
Was that the open door? Should I have kept the goods from that war? I'm afraid of the repercussions of my decision. Well, my decisions in the last season come back to haunt me now. I obeyed, but honestly, I'm disappointed with where I am. In other words, this is not what I expected when you spoke to me in Genesis chapter 12. Where I am now is not where I thought I would be. This does not look like the promise, God. Now, here's the moment where you can listen to me preach or you can start to be honest. And you can begin to say, okay, um, I, I didn't see some of these things coming and I really thought that things would look differently than they do now. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, God, for what you have done, but there are certain things in me that say, I, I, I'm, I'm just starting to question just a little bit what is happening. And so the Bible says that after these things, God comes to Abram. Now, this is so important because it does not say that Abram went to God. <laughs> You see, um, um, God, knowing what was in Abram's heart, came and spoke to him. This is the first time in Scripture that the phrase, the word of the Lord, is mentioned, which means that God comes prophetically to Abram. We spend a lot of our language and songs of worship and our vernacular expressing us going to God. But it's important for us to remember that he is a divine initiator. The Bible says that while we were helpless, utterly helpless, God sent Christ at the right time to die for us. He, he, he is the divine initiator. He knows where you are, and he is the one who initiates. God initiates the call. God initiates the journey of faith. He initiated the interaction with Abram because he knew where Abram was. He sees and he knows. He knows the journey. He knows the path. He knows the wars. He knows the turns in the road. He knows the emotional toll. He knows the choices you've made to honor him at night when no one else saw. He knows the prayers that you prayed. He knows when to come to you. He knows when to encourage you and he knows when to strengthen you. And he knows when you need the word of the Lord. Everyone has an after these things moment. And God meets us in that place to show us in that moment that we had a limited view of him and what he wants to do through us. So God comes to Abram like he's coming to you tonight. This is what God addresses. Because he knows what's in your heart, he addresses what you don't say. He says, don't be afraid. Abram never said he was afraid. But God said, don't be afraid. I know you're afraid, Abram, but don't be. Why? Because I am your shield. I am your protector and defender from any enemy from your past and your present or in the future. You don't have a reason to be afraid of anything. I want to sow that into this room tonight. Some of you will not actually admit that there are certain things about the present or the future or even your past that you're afraid of, hoping that something doesn't come back up, hoping that an enemy that you defeated doesn't rear its head again, hoping that a sickness that God healed doesn't come back into your body. And the Lord comes in this moment to speak to a number of pastors to say, do not be afraid. Why? Because I I am your shield. I am your protector and defender from every single enemy from your past, in your present, or in your future. And he also says to Abram what he also says to us in this moment, I am your reward. I am your exceedingly great reward. In other words, I am the prize. I am the end goal. It's not a building. It's not a land. It's not a number of people. It's not a platform. I am the prize. 
So God addresses quite a bit in verse 1. Don't fear. I am your shield and great reward, protector, defender, and prize. You see, for Abram, this was an important thing to hear because he decided not to take possession of the goods and valuables in order to trust God and not allow it to be said that somebody else did it for him. You see, um, the law of conquest says that he had the right to keep all the wealth of the kings, but instead he gave it all back. This is Genesis chapter 14. The other significance here is that in defeating those kings, he would have taken control of much of Canaan, which was the promised land, but instead he gave it back. Abram was wealthy, but he didn't own land, he leased it. <laughs> so God comes to Abram after that decision and says, I'm your reward. You'll never have a need that I won't meet. I am your reward. God saying I am your reward should have changed everything. God basically says to him, you can have that stuff or you can have me. And after that, you would think that Abram would be satisfied, but his response lets us in on the depths of the wrestling in his heart. Because after God says that, Abram is like, that's cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. But what about your promise? See, this is where most of us, we won't be honest. We won't speak to the fact that we are, we are telling everyone at the conference how blessed we are and how blessed our churches are, even though this last 18 and a half months have been the most difficult for most of us in our entire life. But we're still like, I'm doing good, I'm doing great, or whatever. But in your prayer closet, you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand. I really don't. Like, everything was going good, and now everybody left. You, you won't talk about the scars of your decisions. I understand because I made a decision a few weeks ago that made so many people in our church so upset. I was like, you know what? In my mind, for just one second, I was like, <laughs> Lord help me. For those of you who don't know, God has blessed me to be a very successful songwriter. And, and I didn't even have to take a salary from the church because the royalties for my songs take care of me very, very well. <laughs> right? So, so I'm thinking to myself, I can move to Nashville. I can write songs and I don't need people. <laughs> I could be in a studio by myself writing songs. My family would be good. I'd still be impacting the body of Christ. They'd be singing the language of heaven and I don't have to deal with y'all. And then, you know, like the enemy was like, yeah. And you know what happened? Like one of, one of the, the industry jobs in the music industry that like 20-something-year-old me wanted actually opened up the same week. <laughs> and I was like, I could probably get this job. I have enough cachet now. They probably wouldn't even make me move. <laughs> and my wife was like, I rebuke that. Thank God. <laughs> Abram is like, this is cool. I'm happy about it, but what about your promise? What about a son? I'm reaching an age beyond child conceiving years. I've been living in Canaan for 10 years and I have nothing to show for it. Did I miss it? I thought you said this would happen. When you first came to me, you promised me descendants and after all this time, I don't have anything. <laughs> Now, this is, again, where you have to be honest. I feel like Abram was saying, I thought I would have something to show by now for trusting you. For stepping out in faith. I, I left everything and everyone I knew, and it looks like the blessing you promised me will be enjoyed by somebody else. This is, this is what, <laughs> actually... This is the first time in Scripture that the, the Scripture records that Abram talked to God. Every time that the Lord spoke prior to that, Abram just went and did. The first time he spoke was frustration. 
because we, we don't think God can handle that. Here, the father of faith, like, uh, this is cool, but I thought I would have something to show for by now for trusting you. I thought it would look different than this. And so the truth of the matter is, is this all right for y'all? I, I, I know it's a, okay, all right. We're building somewhere. God says to him in verse four and verse seven, I am going to do what I said. Verse four, you will have a son, you will give, you will, that you'll uh, give birth through, and, and it's not past your time, even though you thought it would happen. By verse seven, he's like, you will receive a promised land. However, something powerful happens in the middle of this exchange in verse five and six. God is basically saying, okay, I brought you here to change your perspective. Let me change your perspective. And the Bible says to us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, I know you've preached it, but just bear with me. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. I find that what happened between verse five and verse six is massive. I understand that we basically have verse five and then we have verse six, but what happened between verse five and verse six is massive. I'll read it again. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be and he believed the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He brought him outside of his ability to naturally conceive what God was inviting him into. He brought him outside and changed his perspective. Count the stars if you can. Now, in 2021, where we are right now, we know a little bit more about this this massive reality that Abram could have known right then. There are about 10 billion galaxies in the observable universe. The number of stars in a galaxy varies, but assuming an average of 100 billion stars per galaxy means that there are about 1 billion trillion stars in the observable universe. <laughs> Even we can't count the stars. Thousands of years later, with the most advanced technology, we can't count them. So imagine trying to do it with the naked eye. He has a supernatural encounter. Something happened in Abram. God says, look toward heaven and see how Big I am, if you can. Hmm. Colossians tells us this. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. We know this scripture. May I suggest that Abram didn't see stars. He saw another world one that impacted how he saw this world. He wasn't trying to count only to give up counting. His hunger was awakened. God did something in that moment to awaken his hunger. God did something in that moment to level up his faith. God allowed Abram to see the end from the beginning. You, you, you know Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. I'll read this in a New Living Translation. Remember the things I've done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God and there is no one like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. Somewhere between verse 5 and 6, 
Abram had an encounter that allowed him to peer into the heart of God. He saw God's heart for creation and for humanity. He saw mercy. He saw grace. He saw redemption. He saw countless people in right standing with God. He, he saw God's son. He saw a city whose builder and maker is God. He saw a place. Amen. Now, this will make sense to us in just a moment. Look towards heaven. In that moment, he was saying to him, dream again, but this time dream bigger. What I want to do is bigger than what you were thinking. Something about that moment caused Abram to believe God and God to account it as righteousness. In between verse 5 and 6, Abram looked towards heaven. Dream bigger than what you were dreaming before. And then it just simply says, and Abram believed God. And God accounted that as righteousness. Wait. Look at the stars. Abram believed God. And God accounted it as righteousness. <laughs> Can I submit to you that Abram saw Christ? You're like, hmm, let me think about it. You're all pastors. I got Bible for you. Don't worry. <laughs> Abram believed in the coming Messiah, which is why the scripture says that all those who have faith like Abraham. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 16. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Abraham believed God for the promised seed. We know that the seed of Abraham is not just a bunch of people, it's Christ. So Abraham had to see something for God to say before the time arrives, I'm going to count you as righteous because you see something and everyone who believes like you will be included in the righteousness. Are y'all here? <laughs> he saw a nation and a savior. Abram's faith that God would send a savior is what allowed his faith to be credited as righteousness. I'm still here to encourage and strengthen you. I just have to build for a moment. Abraham was saved because he believed in the Savior and all who have faith like Abraham are also saved. Abraham was justified by faith in the promised seed and we are justified by faith in Christ who was the promised seed. The word of the Lord allowed him to see into the future. This is why Hebrews chapter 11, verse one through three, this is not a shouting word yet, but you'll get there. Faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we saw or what we now see did not come from anything that was seen. May I suggest something to you because of the season that God has us in. All of us are thrust into the same season. We are never and have never been in a better position for life-changing, life-altering encounters and knowing the heart and mind of God than when we are on the journey of faith and we come to the end of our understanding. When you come to the end of your understanding, you are perfectly positioned for an encounter. 
One of the things that I, I shared with our church, um, just so that we have a little bit of prophetic contextualization, because I've understood that from the beginning of the pandemic until now, one of the things that's allowed people to hold on is prophetic contextualization. It, it causes people to be able to see uh, and cut through the noise of division and everything else that we are dealing with. But one of the things that we see is that while time moves in linear fashion, it is revealed in cycles. And the reality of it is we begin to see certain things happen in time that reveal to us that we are right in a position where we are coming to the end of one season and the beginning of another season. And one of the ways that we know that we're coming to the end of a season and the beginning of a new season is whenever there is global turbulence. Because when the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, show us the end of the age, that word age means cycle of time. They weren't just talking about the end of all times. God in his mercy inserts an age-shifting thing within every generation in order to create urgency within a generation. Otherwise, the generation would say like the people did in 2 Peter, what happened to the coming of the Lord? Because everything has been the same since. So what he says is there will be earth quakes, there will be wars, there will be kingdoms rising against kingdoms, there will be pestilence, there will be all these things happen. And so now what happens is, for most people who put on the lens of eschatology, every time it happens, they say it's the end. But the, the, the challenge that I have for that is, it could be, but also every generation has seen that thing happen as well. I'm pretty sure that at the beginning of the 1900s, every pastor thought it was the end too. So what God does is he allows within every generation a cycle to change. When the end of a cycle is ending and the beginning of a new cycle is happening, there's turbulence in the middle, which lets us know that if we're experiencing turbulence now, we are entering into a new Here's what I love about God. <laughs> The signs of the end of a cycle of time are also the same signs for the end of all time, which means that we don't know which one we're experiencing. <laughs> that lets us know to always stay ready. This is why we can continue to preach that men must be saved. Why? Because we're at a moment right now that either is the end of a cycle of time or the end of all time. And so what this allows us to know is that right now we are in a perfect and prime position as pastors and leaders to begin to declare a new thing. And so what God says is, I want you to dream bigger. I want you to get a new revelation. I want you to be encouraged and strengthened by what I'm doing now <laughs> this is the moment to begin looking for encounters if you have been like me I'm gonna be honest I'm prophetic in nature I read the scripture try to discern the times hear from God and in the last 18 and a half months, my expectation has been so low. I'm going to just be honest. Real talk. It, it's been so low. I had a friend of mine, he was like, man, we're on the cusp of revival. And I was like, man, I so wish I had your faith. Because I was looking at the condition of the church and I'm like, <laughs> they hate one another. They talk about one another. They bite and devour one another like Galatians 5 talks about. Like, I don't, like, I mean, in 2016 in our church, there was such a revival that broke out that it was like, oh my gosh, like this is like everywhere. Like I wrote a book called It's Happening. And I'm like, if it's happening anywhere, it can happen everywhere. And I'm trumpeting and I'm going around the nation trying to stir people's hunger and, and stir their faith. And I'm talking about how people roll into our chair or wheelchairs and walk out and how people come in blind and they leave seeing and how people come in deaf and they leave hearing. And I'm not just talking about hyper. I'm talking about stuff that actually happens in our church. We've never had a healing service in the history of our church, but because the presence of God is so strong in our church, people come in one way and leave another. <laughs> and so I'm like, it's happening. And then 2020 came. And I'm like, I'm looking at all of this stuff 
God, I, I, I don't want to be controversial here or whatever, but, but God began to deal with me very strongly about idolatry in the body of Christ and how we need to repent from idolatry. And then I'm looking like on Instagram and like people are trying to act like nothing's happening. Like we're just going to outlast it and get through it. Like there's nothing to do. Just keep on pressing and we'll finally get back to normal. And I'm like, what if God doesn't want normal? What, what, what if he wants to show you something completely different, which is what I believe he's doing for all those who would actually pay attention to what he's doing? He's like, I, listen, that last season is over. And I know that makes so many people uncomfortable, but like he's not, like there is a system changing thing that God is doing in the earth right now. A cycle is changing and that's why the turbulence is here because anytime there's a cycle change, there's turbulence. I can show it to you over and over in the scripture. One of the, one of the this ain't even my message. <laughs> when God wanted to change the system from the judges to the kings, there was turbulence in the middle because the priest died. <laughs> Samuel literally presided over the turbulent season. Okay. When things stop looking like you thought, you're finally ready to see what he thought. God in his divine wisdom has placed all of us in a prime position for life-changing, life-altering encounters that will change the trajectory of our life. And God has given us a word like after these things to show us that what I'm looking for isn't in this world or from this world. From the moment that God invited Abram to look up, he stopped looking for the Genesis 12 stuff. Can I help you? From that moment forward, he began looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Canaan, the destination was no longer the goal. Intimacy with God was the goal. My reward is not the applause of men. It's not a platform. It's not fame, it's not riches, it's not land or a building. I told our people, we, we were saying, welcome home, when people were coming. And for us, we ended, so, so God gave us this building in the middle of the pandemic. So our last service, last March, was in another building. Our first service was in a new building. So there was a lot of complexities with that. And so when I was telling people welcome home, I was saying, I I'm not talking about the building though. Home is his presence. Because the building was not the reward. We have a refrain at our church that says we won't stop until we see it. We get that at 2 Kings 13 where, where the man uh, shot the, the bow and arrow uh, and, and, and struck the ground only three times and therefore he only got three victories and, and the man of God was angry with him and said you should have struck five or six times because then you would have had complete victory but because you only struck three times you only get three victories. Why would he be mad when he didn't tell him how many times to strike? It's because he was supposed to strike until he was told to stop. So for us, we have a refrain in our church. It's one of the part of the lexicon of our, our, the verbiage of our church. We won't stop until we see it. And the first time we had prayer and intercession in our building, our people were kind of praying like they were content. And I said, uh, let me help you. God didn't bring us this far just to bring us this far. Like, it wasn't, we won't stop until we see the building. We won't stop until we see all that God has promised. Everything. Every prophetic word he's ever spoken over us. We won't stop until we see it. That's the persistence of our prayer. And so for Abram, he stopped looking for Canaan. Some of us, we get so disappointed, discouraged because this last season has knocked our vision off course. That's why I came to strengthen us tonight. I knew it wasn't a rah, rah word because I wanted us to be honest 
with where we are because if we're willing to be honest with where we are as pastors and as leaders, can I suggest to you that what God brought you to this moment to do is say, I want to go forward together with you, you and God, but I want to show you my heart now because your vision has always been too small. It's, it's always been too small. It's never been big enough. And so what God did in this moment for all of us as pastors and leaders is he's inviting us to see differently. He's inviting us to look differently. Abram spent the first part of his journey looking for a place. He spent the remainder of his journey looking for a relationship. He spent the first part of his journey pursuing things. He spent the rest of his life pursuing intimacy. What God showed him shaped the rest of his life. It so shaped the rest of his life that when God invited him to sacrifice Isaac, the Bible says that he reckoned or reasoned. At that point, he saw so much about the future and God's power that he, he saw a foreshadowing already. He's like, listen, I can do this because I've already seen a God who can raise the dead. An enemy that had never been defeated. And yet, he's like, no, God has all power. I see something differently now. I can do whatever you ask me to do. <laughs> and I want you to know my time is done. And we're, we're at the end. John John said, keep going. <laughs> Abram's faith from that moment made the impossible logical. I'm going to say that again. Abram's faith from that moment made the impossible logical. What I know that the Spirit of God wants to do tonight is so infuse some of you with faith, so strengthen and encourage some of you with the curveballs that you've been walking through because this is one of those moments where literally you don't have to guess if everybody's experiencing the same thing because we are. Where the whole world has been thrust into the same thing. And I know that a lot of times we just prefer not to talk about it, to move on and stuff like that. And I understand that the reality of it is there's a lot of different thoughts about a lot of different things. Because I live in Florida, it's like very present. <laughs> Florida's different. <laughs> but there is a reality about what this has done for the stride of your vision. That, that there's a truth about pastoring in this moment that says we were going it was rocking we were everything was on track we had all these plans we were going to do this we were going to do that and now for some of you your expectation is so low that literally you don't even know if you want to cast vision right now if you'd be honest you, you, a, a, a vision check for a number of you would be how much you talk about the future now how much you're just trying to get through tomorrow or get through today because you, you, you're not even like, I'm not even sure what next year is going to be. I'm not even sure, like, are we going to be doing this? Is something new going to come? Are we going to be dealing with this? Are we going to be dealing with that? And so right now, I don't really want to talk about the future. Let's just talk about how to get people through today. And I totally get it because that's the heart of a shepherd. Can I speak to your prophetic self? There is what we have to do for the people that we serve. But then there's something God wants to do for you in your heart. It's something God wants to do in you. Something God wants to do in your heart to say, wake up. I want to stir something in you that what it was that you saw before, it was great. And I know you're frustrated because it's not happening now, but that's because I did all of this to get the body into a position to see what I want. And what he wants is greater than anything you ever wanted. Greater than anything you ever saw. And I don't know who I'm preaching to or who I came in here to speak to tonight. But what I do know is that for some of you, if you'd be willing to be honest, you've actually been discouraged over this last season. And I came to encourage and strengthen you and tell you that you are in the best position you have ever been in. Now, God wants you to dream again, but it's bigger. I'll close with this. God has blown my mind as it relates to vision. Like, really. 
everything that 20 something year old William saw, this is gonna, not many people can say this. He did all of it. I'm serious. He did like every desire that I ever had. Like he did, he did something for me a couple of years ago that just was kind of like him showing off. Um, like when I started leading worship and stuff like that, I didn't have like the ambitions to be, you know, certain places and all that kind of stuff. And I had no idea that I'd go to 50 countries. I had no idea that I'd be nominated for Grammys. I had no idea that I'd get Billboard Awards. I had no, none of that. Like none of it. I just really wanted to be faithful to the local church. Like my, my sincere desire was to, to write the language of our house. It wasn't, I wasn't thinking, okay, like I'm, we're gonna write the songs of the nation sing. Like I had no clue. I, I promise you, I had no clue. I didn't have that kind of ambition, but, but I did write a couple things down that I thought would be cool. <laughs> God, it, you know, I don't have this ungodly ambition, but it'd be kind of cool if this happened, but if it doesn't, I'm good. He did all of it. Like all of it. And then there, there was one thing that I wrote a little bit later. There's a, a night of worship uh, somewhere on earth. I'll do that since we're streaming. And every year, they bring together over a million people to worship. And for whatever reason, even though my songs are being sung all over the world, and particularly in this nation, I had not been invited. And I was like, okay, it's cool, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of a 10-year cycle in which the Lord had done basically all of it in a 10-year period at the end of the cycle I got invited to go do that and when I got there the Lord was basically like I just wanted to finish off your list so now you can spend the rest of your life on my dream And I felt like, I felt like, okay, I, I told my wife, I said, well, I accomplished all my dreams. So either that means I'm going home to the Lord soon, or he has something bigger. He definitely has something bigger. And if I didn't know it, he sent Patrick Kitely and Prophet Butler to, to say stuff publicly. <laughs> in front of our whole church that began to outline the last part of my life. Could it be in this moment that your unspoken frustration about how this last season has been has actually been a divine setup by God to give you the kind of encounter that would change the trajectory of your life? I actually believe that part of my assignment here was to put that possibility in front of you. There are things that, whenever you come to a conference like this, you'd like to preach and make everybody rah, rah, and stand up and respond and everything else. But you have to be obedient to the assignment. And the assignment tonight it's to so into you the fact that God has put you in a prime position, even if you're frustrated, even if you don't understand, even if you don't like the journey. He's put you in a prime position to give you the kind of encounter that will literally alter the trajectory of your life and your church. Can you lift up your hands in this moment? I believe the Lord is about to release encounters in this room that will literally change you. I believe that he's brought you to a place in this moment where you can be honest because your people aren't here. To say, God, I've been, I've not understood, I've been frustrated, I've not gotten it. This process you have me in 
to be honest with you, I felt like you almost forgot about what you promised me. Nothing seems to be working. Nothing seems to be going right. I'm just trying to keep my equilibrium and keep from falling out and everything else. And the Lord comes in a moment like this to strengthen brothers and sisters from around this nation and around the world to say, I'm putting you in a position to give you an encounter that will change what you see for the rest of your life. I'm going to my seat, but I, I want to I sow this into you. My friend Nathaniel Bassey, who is a dynamic worship leader from Nigeria came to our church this weekend and began to sing prophetically over our house and it is the only song that any of us who are at our church can sing right now. He made it up on the spot because the Spirit gave it to him and literally the velocity of what we're seeing God do as a result is blowing our minds. And I'm going to sing it. But the reason I'm going to sing it is a simple chorus. The reason I'm going to sing it is because you are going to sing it as a prophecy to your future. It goes like this. It says, See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we were waiting for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. That's it. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we were waiting for has come to pass. See what the Lord has done. Come on, sing it just one more time in this room. Come on, say. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we were waiting for has come to pass. See what the Lord has. Now you say, how does this song make any sense with what you just said? This is what you are going to sing in your future. The Lord is getting ready to show you some things that literally are going to be mind-blowing to you. But you are coming into a day, I'm prophesying to you now, you are coming into a day where you will begin to sing this song and people will begin to ask you what happened and you'll say, see what the Lord has done. What I was waiting for has come to pass. What I was praying for has come to pass. And this is the song of your future. As God begins to open up your mind, as God begins to give you encounters and begin to open up your vision, Vision, you are going to begin to sing this song as a present reality in your future and you're going to remember this and you're going to begin to sing see what the Lord has done see what the Lord has done one more time lift up your hands all over this room I'm done father I've been obedient to you I've spoken what you told me I've done what you told me to do and I know that there are people in this room who needed what you told me to do. And so now, Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would begin to grant encounters with you all over this room all over this room. Father, I pray that you begin to open up vision. Encourage and strengthen those who have been weakened by this last season. May they leave this conference never the same. May they leave this conference with strength. May they leave this conference with joy. May they leave this conference with vision. May they leave knowing that you are with them, that you are literally opening up their eyes and their spirit to begin to see what they've not seen before, that you've placed them in a prime position for divine 
encounter. And Father, I thank you that in this moment, you are releasing that. I pray, strengthen these pastors and leaders in Jesus' name. Would you sing to your future? Would you sing to your future? Come on, say. See what the Lord has.